Next, City Net 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Before I introduce today's program, I want to acknowledge one of our staff members, Brian Markowitz, is working his last day as a City Club member, and we're very much appreciative of his efforts. Uh, the <laughs> He's taken a position as Senior Associate with Metropolitan Group Public Relations. He's been with the club for three years and served us well. I'll miss his good humor and his bright, if not sarcastic, remarks from time to time. <laughs> Our board host today is Arnold Cogan, member of the Board of Governors and managing partner of Cogan, Owens and Cogan. He will ask the first question. <coughs> Following Arnold's question, we will first open the question from the floor with a question from one of our Reynolds students. Following that question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members uh, in the audience. If you have questions you'd like to write, please write them down and uh, raise your hand and a, a staff member will bring them up to the, the head table. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Barney and Worth, Kaiser Permanente Health Systems, and Wells Fargo Bank. We're very grateful for their support. We're honored to have a distinguished journalist with us today to discuss an issue of serious concern, the initiative process. I'd like to take a little liberty with a quote from a journalist, uh, 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 P.J. O'Rourke, who says, we journalists do not have to step on roaches. All we need to do is to turn on the light and see who runs for cover. <laughs> David Broder's new book, Democracy Derailed, The Initiative Process and the Power of Money, is a chilling reminder we may have a system that's run amok. This morning's Oregonian reports that yesterday the, the Oregon Supreme Court for ballot titles approved 15 titles for initiatives with over 50 already approved. In a cat and mouse game, the opponents and supporters have measures and countermeasures. Tim Nesbitt of the AFL-CIO said it's like rock breaks scissors, scissors cuts paper, multiple levels of a game. Here a serious, if not deadly game. A timely program for City Club with David Broder is certainly in order. David's reputation for integrity, factual accuracy, and insight has made him one of the more respected journalists in the country. In addition to the Pulitzer Prize, he's won numerous awards for his work, including, among others, the Fourth Estate Award from the National Press Foundation and the National Society of Newspaper Columnists Lifetime Achievement Award. His twice-weekly twice column with the Washington Post runs in more than 300 newspapers around the world. He's a regular commentator on CNN, NBC, and PBS. He is the author or co-author of seven books. David, to keep a sense of balance and perspective in Washington for the last two years, let alone close to 40, is an award in its own right. We look forward to your comments. David Broder. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you particularly for the invitation to be at this microphone in this distinguished forum in one of my favorite cities in this country. Uh, the uh, text for today's sermon <laughs> comes from a noted political scientist, Dear Abby. Uh, in her column on Monday, Abby was asked by AP in Spartanburg, South Carolina, to repeat a column that she had done earlier about explaining different forms of government. Uh, and I'll give you just a couple of examples of her explanations. Communism. You have two cows. 
The government takes both of them and gives you part of the milk. Capitalism, you have two cows, you sell one of them and buy a bull. And then we get to the one that is most relevant for our discussion today, democracy. Abby says, in a democracy, everyone has two cows, then a vote is taken, and whatever the majority decides to do, you do, and that's no bull. <laughs> she boiled down into that one definition what took me 200 and some pages to, <laughs> to write in, uh, in this book. But I am delighted to be here, and particularly in this city and state, to talk about the issue that we've already seen uh, stirs a good deal of strong feelings uh, among Oregonians. Uh, I grew up in Illinois, where not only do we not have an initiative, uh, the, in the daily machine days, uh, we weren't really sure that we wanted voters to participate much in any form of, uh, of politics. The best uh, definition of the daily organization involved a young, naive person who came from another city and decided that uh, he wanted to get involved in politics in Chicago. So he went down to the ward committee office and presented himself and said, I'd like to volunteer for the organization to work in the campaign. And the ward committeeman looked at him and said, who sent you? And he said, nobody sent me. I just wanted volunteer. And the committeeman said, we don't want nobody that nobody sent. <laughs> that became the title of a really excellent book about Chicago politics as it, as it worked then. So let me put my own bias on the table. That's the kind of governmental system that I uh, grew up with, and frankly had very little acquaintance with initiative system or the politics of the initiative campaign, found myself out here in the fall of 1997 when Oregon was about to vote for the second time on the issue of physician-assisted suicide. And talking to people on both sides of that issue, interviewing, on both sides of that issue, I came <coughs> to understand how deeply and powerfully emotional that issue was for people whichever side of the equation they were on. It was an issue that stirred the most profound ethical and moral and religious passions and one which truly went to the meaning of life and the questions of who controls life, whether it is up to God and God alone to decide when we come into this world and when we leave the world, or whether an individual ought to have the autonomous right under certain painful circumstances to decide to end his own life and to secure help from physicians in doing that. Listening to that debate, I found myself wondering and on occasion asking, is this a good issue to submit to the vote of the people, particularly since you knew at that point that the Oregon public was almost evenly divided on that question? And people were polite, but basically they conveyed to me in their responses that that was the dumbest question they had ever heard asked <laughs> there because they said, you know, who better than the people to make this decision? you certainly wouldn't want to leave it up to the politicians. Well, I came back from Oregon to my paper, and I said to the editors there that <coughs> this is really a different way of governing, of writing law, from what we're most familiar with and what we write about all the time. We ought to try to pay attention to it because half the country now writes the laws this way, and increasingly in number and in terms of the importance of the issue, this is how public policy is being made. So they said, go ahead, you can do that if you want to. And I launched into this reporting project that ended up with this book, Democracy Derailed. I learned more about this process here in Oregon than any other place. Greg Kafori and others of, and his friends who are strong advocates of the initiative process helped educate me. Some of the critics here helped educate me about it. And I've learned, as this last half hour has just demonstrated, 
fact, and in Oregon more than any other state that I visited, the process itself has become a matter of significant debate. I also learned that here, as in other states, the uh, initiative process in the last 20 years has spawned what could literally be called the initiative industry, the firms that make a living out of collecting the signatures, the lawyers who do the legal work that's involved, and the consultants that manage the campaigns for and against initiatives. What I didn't know until, for the purposes <coughs> of the book, I went back into some of the literature of the progressive era, the era that gave birth to the initiative process, that brought it to this state and other states from its birthplace in Switzerland, was, what I didn't know was that the initiative industry was almost as old as the initiative process. And I thought I'd share with you just one thing that delighted me. This is an article in McClure's Magazine in 1911, 10 years after the initiative process came to Oregon, describing what was happening then with people gathering signatures for initiative campaigns. And I quote, they, <coughs> they are found, meaning the signature collectors, in practically every part of the state. They invade the office buildings, the apartment houses, and the homes of Portland, and tramp from farmhouse to farmhouse. I love this next sentence. Young women, ex-book canvassers, broken down clergymen, People who in other communities would find their natural level as sandwich men. <laughs> Dapper, hustling youths. <laughs> Perhaps working their way through college. All find useful employment in soliciting signatures at five or 10 cents a name." End quote. Well, the price has obviously gone up uh, uh, since then. So it's nothing new, uh, to my surprise, that uh, there is this initiative industry. What is new, I think, is the way in which the initiative process has now taken on a life of its own and really taken wing in this state, which has had more initiatives than any other, but in many other places as well. Why is this? Part of it is clearly the frustration with the legislature, which on your issue and many other issues simply chooses not to act or respond when there is a call for, for action. But the real attraction, I think, in this day and age for the initiative process is its decisiveness. You can really get something done by putting an initiative on the ballot. In fact, you can write law or constitutional provisions exactly the way that you want them done. And if you have the capacity to get the initiative on the ballot, you can get it done in the next election. It, in an age where all of us now are trying to learn to operate at computer speed, this is a very attractive form of political decision making. I had an interesting experience earlier this year when, like all the other political reporters, I spent the month of January in the state of New Hampshire. And New Hampshire, as you may or may not know, has become a high-tech state. Indeed, the incidence of high-tech workers in the New Hampshire population is higher than in any other of the states in this country. Because they've become so significant there, I decided to take a week or 10 days away from chasing the candidates around New Hampshire and tried to work my way into that high-tech world in New Hampshire try to understand what the political agenda was of the people in that world and how they viewed the political process and government, what they were looking for in a presidential candidate. And what I discovered in the process is that the people in that world have what I have to just bluntly say is enormous disdain and contempt for the people in the political world. And it was best expressed to me by a man that I met at a high-tech exposition in Manchester, New Hampshire, who said, look, in my world, this was a president of a startup company. In my world, we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And if I've got a client who calls and says, I've got a problem with your system, I'm on the next plane to that client to try to figure out and solve that problem right now. In the political world, he said, all those people do is dither and dither and dither, and they never make a damn decision. And I think that's the attitude, I think, that many of the folks who come out of this new culture in our country have there. And it's one of the things that now fuels, I think, the increased use of the initiative process. Indeed, in your neighbor's state to the south, a number of Silicon Valley millionaires have become prominent by sponsoring their own ballot initiatives. One of them that succeeded created what they call the blanket primary in, Calif in, in California, where all candidates of all parties are on the same ballot in the primary, and any citizen, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, can choose to vote for a Democratic candidate running for governor, a Republican candidate running for the Senate, a Green Party candidate running for the State Senate, a Libertarian running for the State House of Representatives, and in effect have changed the whole nominating system of California. Another Silicon Valley millionaire passed the initiative, pa financed the initiative that ended bilingual education in Cali California. Another one passed an initiative which is still held up in the courts to change the political finance rules in California. In November, there'll be two more initiatives on the ballot affecting the education system in the country, one of them a vouchers initiative, another an initiative to reduce the margin that is needed for approval of local school bond issues. So the high-tech psychology, I think, of wanting to move fast and get a decision made, get the problem solved, is one of the things that's really driving this process now. The other evening I was up in Seattle on a forum about this same topic, and one of the high-tech people up there, after hearing my sort of boring, academic-sounding questions about the efficacy or the appropriateness of the initiative process, said to me, look, David, it's a different world now, and whether you like it or people your age like it, it is a different world. We live in a consumer-driven society, he said, where the individual is going to make his or her choices effective. It's a consumer-driven economy, it's a consumer-driven culture, and make up your mind, it's going to be a consumer-driven politics as well. One of the noted pollsters in that state, a man named Stuart Elway, who was also on the panel, was asked in the question and answer period, what do you think? Is it possible or practical now for people to vote on issues directly, not have to go through elected representatives and do it with some frequency, even on the national level? He said it is absolutely possible. Now he said we could conduct elections on issues daily if you wanted to have the issue of the day we could do it on the issue of the week we could do it on the issue of the month there is no practical barrier to doing that he pointed out that we've just had the first internet election in the history of this country in arizona where the democratic party in arizona elected its delegates to the national convention in an internet election and you found I wound up by saying there is no practical objection to this. The only barrier is if you have some philosophical objection to making law or rewriting constitutions this way. Well, are there any serious philosophical objections to doing it that way? I began this reporting process pretty much agnostic and very largely ignorant about how initiative politics really worked. One of the things that I discovered was that the initiative system, which was brought to Oregon and other states by progressives who saw that the legislatures of their day had almost literally been bought and paid for 
by the railroads, the banks, and the other inter economic interests of that time, and were seeking a way to empower citizens to write laws without control by the special interests. That, that initiative system today, while it still has the capacity and the availability for the occasional citizen-inspired movement, is increasingly being used either by the same interest groups that were the original targets of the reformers or by wealthy individuals who have political agendas of their own that they wish to carry out. I guess this was brought home to me most vividly when I was interviewing a lawyer in San Francisco whose firm makes a specialty of handling initiatives. They write the language and they try to shepherd them through the whole process of winding up often in court, defending them in court. And I said to him, suppose instead of my coming in here this morning as a reporter from the Washington Post, suppose I was an average citizen of California. I've got an idea for something that I think would make an awful good law and I want to get it on the ballot. Could you just kind of walk me through step by step what you would do and how the process would work? And he said, well, the first thing is I would ask you the million dollar question. And I said, what's the million dollar question? He said, do you have a million dollars? <laughs> he said, because if you don't have a million dollars, you are not going to get your initiative on the ballot in the state of California. And that, of course, is just the opening bid because after that come the lawyers' fees and after that come the campaign consultants and the pollsters and the media advisors and the people who make the ads and so on to conduct the whole campaign for, for the initiative. The second thing that I learned from my reporting that caused me some concern about the way in which the initiative process operates in the real world now is what I guess I would categorize as the rigidity of effects. In this state and other states, it is possible to pass an initiative by simple majority at a particular election, whatever the turnout may be in that election, which thenceforth requires a supermajority, two-thirds, for any change, subsequent change in that policy that has been passed. In other words, a majority of the moment can make it impossible under the initiative system for a majority of the future to change or adjust policy to the changing circumstances of that time. A second area of rig rigidity of effects, and I assume if I haven't offended everybody in the room up to this point, I will get the rest of you on this one. I think the term limits which were passed in 18 states by initiative very quickly after the term limits movement began to operate in this country. I think term limits also represent a kind of rigidity of effect in the sense that a term limits requirement affects every single member of the legislative body, whether she has been a conscientious, <laughs> creative, legislator contributing to the process, or a sluggard who simply draws the pay, shows up as, a as required, but makes no real effort to engage in the thing, or the person who goes into public office with the idea that here's how I can profit from this office. Good, bad, or indifferent, all of them are treated exactly the same in a system of term limits and they are turned out of office at exactly the same moment. But the real concerns that I developed as I was doing this reporting went to what I suppose you could call philosophical objections. The people who wrote the Constitution of the United States were very clear in their minds about the difference between a democracy and a republic. They thought that a democracy ruled by simple majority almost inherently posed threats to individual liberty. That the majority of the moment might find the behavior, the attitude, the actions 
of some individuals in that society abhorrent to them and simply decide we're going to legislate and proscribe that behavior, thought, or action. So they thought that this was something that, if the, I don't know if they used the term, but could pose a real threat to civil liberties. More importantly, they understood even in the American society of that day and age, which was far less complex and diverse than today's America, that in a society of that kind, there would almost always be groups less than a majority in the society who would have strong concerns about any particular policy action that ought to be taken into consideration before the majority in that society turned their sentiment of the moment into law. These were men, they were all men, who really powerfully respected the force of law and the rule of law. They understood that almost any law was in one way or another going to infringe on the liberties and the prerogatives of an individual or a group within that society. So they wanted to be very, very certain as conservatives that before something became law, that it be thoroughly discussed, analyzed, debated, and that there be a genuine consensus in the society that this was necessary for the good of the society. So they created all of those checks and balances which we learned about in our civics textbooks, all of the elaborate procedural safeguards that are part of the legislative process. That a bill has to go through a committee in one house and then be passed by that house and then to a committee and the full house on the other side of the Capitol building, that there be a conference between the two chambers to adjust the differences, that the executive, the president, or the governor be involved through his veto power, that there be a series of inevitable negotiations in which those who are the majority of the moment have to deal directly with the objections of those on the other side and those on the other side often being able in that negotiation, if not to stop it from becoming law, at least to adjust the measure in ways that make it tolerable for them to accept that it is going to become law. Now, they were not people who were oriented particularly to the efficiency of government. What they wanted was a strong government, but a limited government. They wanted one which could be effective when there was a clear agreement that this is what the government should do, but they also wanted a government which would not overstep simply because the majority of the moment thought that this would be a nifty idea to pass into law. That, it seems to me, is the choice that we face with the initiative system. It is a different kind of government. And what I'm hoping with this little book and with the kind of debate which you have fostered so well here in this club over the years before I ever learned about the initiative system, what I hope is that we can get our fellow citizens to consider the advantages and the risks in this system of initiative government. It is growing, it is spreading, it is enormously popular. Unless I miss my guess, it's likely to be advocated at the national level in some future presidential election. So I hope we will pause and consider the experience that we've now built up, over, particularly over the last 20 years, in the states that now have the initiative system and certainly Oregon has much to teach the rest of the country about that system. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Broder. Um, I am a consultant, and I'll say uh, up, up front here, I am not one of those dreaded campaign consultants. So I'll confess that right now. Uh, one of the hats I wear in the City Club is uh, chair of the Advocacy Committee. And that's a relatively new committee in the City Club. We have some of the members of that committee here in the room. What we're trying to do is to develop tools um, with which we can uh, implement uh, the recommendations and findings and conclusions of the City Club and try to accomplish some of the good work of the research. The 1996 report on the initiative and referendum was referred to earlier and is the subject uh, in part of uh, what Mr. Broder is talking about today. One of our frustrations has been to try to accomplish the uh, recommendations that were, was contain were contained in that very thoughtful report. And so, Mr. Broder, my question is, uh, do you have any suggestions? Give us some advice on how we can persuade Oregonians to fix this initiative system here in Oregon. <laughs> you can be the consultant. Yeah. Well, I'm not a consultant either, but, uh, and I certainly have zero experience in lobbying the legislature in, in uh, Salem, so I don't think I have much practical use to suggest to you, except in the very broadest terms, which I expect are redundant, because I expect you've already done it. I think it's persuade you uh, I mean this the first step at least has to be persuasion of the public in every state that I covered in reporting there the initiative process is wildly popular and legislators in many states told me that they are very fearful of quote unquote tampering with the initiative process uh, I guess the most vivid expression of this came from a woman legislator in Colorado who, when I was talking, Colorado's legislature has been either bolder or more imprudent than most, depending on how you view it, in really trying to ch change the initiative system in that state. And several statutes that came out of Colorado have wound up in the Supreme Court uh, uh, as a result. But uh, this legislator said, that uh, she was giving up, not going to get her fingers burned on that. And again, I said, why not? And she said, well, I'll tell you what one of my constituents told me. And I, she said, I don't think he was speaking just for himself. He said to me, you people in the legislature have your thing, but the initiative is our thing, and you don't better mess around with our thing. Good afternoon. My name is Lacey Hamron. I'm a senior at Reynolds High School, and we're very honored to be here today. Um, our question was, do you think that because of an already low voter turnout, that if the initiative system is further controlled, that it would result in an even lower vo voter turnout? Thank you for a very good question, Lacey. I'm, I don't know the answer to that question. The political scientists who have studied this process much longer and much more thoroughly than I ever have uh, are sort of divided about where they come out. Some of them believe that because the ballot with a lot of different initiative propositions becomes very long and intimidating, that it may reduce voter turnout. Others think that at least some initiatives that really stir people's interest could be a lure to people to come out and vote who might not care that much about the candidates running for office. The one thing that we do know is that in most states, in most elections, there's a significant fall off between the number of people who vote for the races at the top of the ballot and those who stay around long enough to vote on all of the initiatives that are down the ballot. It'll be very interesting to see now that Oregon has decided to conduct all of its elections from home to see whether people now have more patience to work their way th down through the whole ballot. But I don't know what the answer to that's going to be. Yes. I, I have a question. Um, my name is Ed Marks. I'm a city club member. And uh, I've got a little problem with this that maybe you can help me with. And that is that uh, democracy is well known for being sloppy, messy, and clumsy. 
but unfortunately any uh, attempt to make it efficient and smoother operating makes it also less democratic. Uh, what is your answer to that? Well, uh, my answer would be inadequate, but I think the folks who wrote the Constitution were a lot smarter than this generation of politicians and certainly than this generation of journalists. Uh, and I tend to rely on their answer, which was that in the trade-off between haste or efficiency and thoughtful regard for the views of all of the elements in a society, that we ought to tilt our system in a direction that requires us to consider all and varying points of view rather than allowing the majority of the moment simply to express its will. You know, one of the characteristics about the initiative process, which appears on the face of it to be a highly public process, I mean, what could be more public than putting something to a vote of the people. The public decides. If you think about the individual steps along the way, however, it is not quite as public a process as it first appears. The language of the initiative is written in private by most, by the people who are most concerned with framing that language to achieve their particular policy or political objective. The end of the process in the voting booth is not the old New England town meeting. It is every single voter in privacy deciding what is best for that individual voter that it confronted with. And the appeals that are made in the course of the campaign on an initiative are often framed in terms of the most narrow definition of your personal self-interest. You vote for this and your taxes will be reduced by this amount. Or you vote for this and you will be able from that point on to do whatever that specific objective may be. It is very much of a self-interest kind of a campaign that characterizes most of the initiative campaigns, at least, that I covered in the 1998 election cycle. Uh, Greg Kafuri. Uh, I wanted to piece together some of, the, uh, some of your remarks and, and comment on them and ask you to, to respond. Uh, in the 23 uh, states that have the initiative process, don't you think that people don't walk into political campaigns and get asked, who sent you? Uh, isn't it a fact that political cynicism in this country has uh, reached uh, epidemic levels at the same time that this system, which has been around for 100 years, is, everywhere it exists, wildly popular. And what conclusions do you come from that, do you draw from that? And finally, uh, we're not running a business here. We're trying to get better people. That's the real goal of a democracy. And having people intimately involved with the decisions that affect their own fate is going to make better people in the long run. They may not like what they do one year. They may change it the next but we're going to get better people in the long run, aren't we? <laughs> well, the first thing that I conclude from uh, your comments, and they're very well taken, is that the viewpoint which I have been expressing here is very much of a minority viewpoint. And one of the reasons that I turned these articles <coughs> for the Washington Post into this little book was a deliberate desire on my part to stir the pot. I mean, you've had a very good debate going about the initiative process in Oregon for many years. And as I said earlier, this club has been a major contributor to that debate. But in many other states where the initiative process exists, it's just sort of been taken for granted. I hope that in a small way, I can begin to stir people up to argue about the merits and the shortcomings of this of this process. Now, does it make for better people? Uh, that's an interesting uh, argument uh, that, that I had not encountered or thought much about. I think to the extent that it gives people a sense that some vital decisions are in our hands 
and therefore we have the responsibility to deal with them responsibly. You could make that case. But I'm concerned about what it is that voters have available to them. In a society like ours, where people have many, many things that are happening in their lives, the availability of good information about initiatives becomes a very critical factor. I am not, I want to be very clear, suggesting in any respect that the American people are too dumb to decide these things for themselves. I've spent 40 years covering politics, and every one of those years, I've spent a good deal of my time out walking precincts, knocking on people's doors, talking to people in their living rooms. And I come away from that experience with an enormous respect for the common sense and the good judgment of the American people. But I think it is a challenge, even to the most conscientious citizen, to figure out what is the right thing to do or the thing that's in my interest to do when you're confronted with, as the voters in California were on the primary ballot, 20 separate statewide initiatives in many communities, almost as many local initiatives. The pollsters in, those, in a number of states have told me that they not uncommonly find that a week before Election Day, when they take their last round of polling, 50 or 60 percent of the voters are genuinely undecided about how they're going to vote on initiatives. And they are scrambling at the last minute, therefore, to try to find something. The final point I would, would make is that in the interviewing with people in the initiative industry, one of the things that I learned, and they were quite candid, I think, about this, the people who conduct the campaigns for and against initiatives were very clear in saying, we do not regard it as our responsibility to explain the initiative to people. These are often complex legalese, lots of provisions in them, so on. Their job, as they define it, is to find some fairly simple, easily grasped symbol or message which will either attract people to that initiative or repel them from that initiative. And that, it strikes me, is not exactly the definition of how we would want to empower people in our society. Uh, Dan yes. Goldie, member. Um, first, let me say, I think in this audience and with the City Club of Portland, which has studied the issue, you're not in a minority. <laughs> you alluded in your statement to the importance of due legislative process, uh, going through a legislative procedure where legislation can get adequate consideration. Nothing we found in our study of that issue of the legislature, nothing defeats that purpose more than legislation by initiative instead of going through a legislative process. And the question that we had confronted in our study of the legislature was, how do you make a legislature more effective so it can operate in a way that satisfies people so that they're satisfied with going through due process in a legislature rather than going to the initiative? Do you have any suggestions other than the term limits issue that you mentioned for how to improve the legislative process based on your observations around the country? Well, I don't want to give you another speech in long, as long and boring as the first one, but I think <clears throat> there are two things that, are, that would help. One is more press attention to what's actually happening in the legislature. It's been my observation in many states where the state capital is not in the largest city of that state, that media coverage of the state level of government is probably the weakest of any level of government. There are plenty of reporters, maybe too many reporters in Washington, D.C. Most news organizations cover their city halls pretty closely. But the state level of government is often ignored. In California, perhaps the most flagrant example, 
Sacramento is the site of the fifth or sixth largest government in the world. There is not a single television station in the state of California outside of Sacramento which keeps a full-time correspondent and camera crew in the state capitol. There's no way that the people running that government can feel that the constituents are keeping an eye on what they're doing. So they don't feel that kind of public scrutiny and, and pressure that they need to feel. The second thing, and this really would take us into an area where I tend to be very discursive and, and boring, I happen to think that political parties are important in the working of our government. And to the extent that we have sort of lost political parties, where it's become candidate-centered politics, every person for himself or herself, I think it's made it much harder for legislative bodies to function. Here's a question, written question. Could you comment on the pr problems posed by the initiative process in the budget context? It seems particularly troubling to pass ballot measures with major fiscal impact <coughs> without knowledge of the rest of the budget. Well, I agree with that observation, and I know that there are many people in Oregon who believe that this state is an example of, of, of that, uh, uh, but you're not alone by, by, uh, by any means. Uh, the, uh, probably the easiest kind of initiative to sell to the voters is one which promises immediately to reduce or roll back their taxes. And the second easiest may very well be one that mandates that the state government spend a lot of money on some cause that most people would like to see finance. So that you have in many states now this interesting push and pull where taxes have been rolled back but spending for schools or roads or whatever the particular thing has been mandated. As a result, the elected officials who are in theory responsible for those basic budgetary decisions about state or local government find that they have about that much discretion in terms of allocating resources to what they may think are the needs of the moment. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member, uh, you alluded in your million dollar uh, question story to the role of money in the process. I was a little surprised to not hear you talk more about the impact of spending during the campaign on the outcome of the vote, uh, especially on economic taxation spending or regulatory issues where you have you know, private sector uh, interests very uh, significantly affected and the ability of, of those private sector interests to generate money uh, one way or the other. Uh, so I'd be interested in what your take is on the role of spending in the campaigns and how that can swing the votes during the course of the campaign. And uh, if, if that is a problem, nonetheless, how that relates to the role of big spending in electing the alternative, which is the legislative process. The role of big money in campaigns either way. Well, <coughs> Uh, the, the reason, main reason I didn't allude to it was that I thought I was testing your tolerance with a speech as long as the one I gave. A uh, couple of observations about spending. Uh, there's been a good deal of political science about this, and my friend Dane Waters, who is here, and we're going to have the fun of talking about this uh, together. Dane runs the Initiative and Referendum Institute in Washington and is a very eloquent spokesman for the initiative process. We're going to be on a panel together uh, at K2 this evening, taping for, for their, their Sunday uh, uh, broadcast, Dane would point, will point out to you, or would point out to you, that the political scientists largely agree that money alone cannot pass an initiative, that money spent heavily to defeat an initiative has much more prospect of success than money spent heavily to promote an initiative. But in Leak, again, in my reporting, I found a number of instances where the money was available on the side that was promoting the initiative, and no real money was available on the other side. One of the examples, and again, I'm not trying to argue the merits or demerits of the proposal, but simply the process. Uh, there were three million, are three millionaires in this country. One of them, a uh, fellow who's quite, whose name is quite well known, named George Soros, who has made a fortune in trading currencies, these three folks have decided among themselves that the war on drugs is a really dumb idea. And so they have set out to rewrite the drug laws 
in as many states as they can do through the initiative process. In every state where they have put an initiative on the ballot so far, they have succeeded. And one of the reasons that they have had this remarkable success is that the folks on the other side of that question really don't have a natural financial constituency. The law enforcement community is not a fundraising organization. And so in state after state, there's been literally millions spent to promote these initiatives and virtually nothing against them. So the political science view is one that I find myself questioning a little bit. <coughs> Bill Wyeth, City Club member. In Oregon, our immediate question for the voters is whether there's more risk with an initiative to adopt a constitutional amendment than there is to adopt a statute. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Well, I am not here as an advocate of one side or the other in the interesting debate that you had. The one thing I would say that, <coughs> just on the basis of my reporting, is that the higher the threshold of signatures that you set for qualifying an initiative for the ballot, the hard, larger the cost of getting that initiative on the ballot. And it seems to me that that rule will apply in Oregon, that the higher the threshold, the more it will cost to get an initiative on, on the ballot. Now, that may be desirable or undesirable in your, in, your, in your point of view, and I heard it argued in both ways here just a few moments ago. But that is, seems to me to be a certainty. Laura Nigro, City Club member. I'm going to zoom way out and get academic on you. With all due respect to the, the wonderful intellectual lights that created our magnificent Constitution, is it possible that they just really couldn't foresee this far into the future with our current profile, including everything such as the installation of the information age, uh, an entire spectrum of ethnic groups living here, suffrage for everyone. And if they didn't, just in case they didn't quite see all of what we have actually today and where we're headed, what does that imply about the effectiveness of that marvelous constitution that they generated now and into our foreseeable and unforeseeable future? I thank you for that wonderful uh, question, and uh, I have to observe without, uh, I hope, embarrassing you that there is a generational gap, generation gap in this uh, debate, that the old geezers like me tend to think we ought to be very careful before we abandon the system of government that we have known, because we have flourished under that system of government. And I mean that literally, that for all the frustrations that all of us feel from time to time <coughs> with the workings or the lack of workings in our government, it has been an enormous blessing to this country as a nation and for individuals in this, in this country. So I frankly concede that my bias is heavily against tinkering with that system unless I'm very sure that the system that will replace it or succeed it has the potential for nurturing the kind of society that we have been. I tried to suggest earlier why I thought inherently in an initiative system there are fewer safeguards for individual liberty and fewer safeguards for the views, interests, considerations, and needs of groups in the society that are smaller than a majority. So I guess I just have to rest on that proposition and accept the possibility that your generation may decide very differently that given the capacity that it now exists for us to be informed in our homes through internet websites as well informed as any legislator about any issue that comes to the floor of the legislature of con or Congress, given the capacity to vote with great frequency on any issues that we want to vote on ourselves, that your generation may very well decide to substitute it. I just hope we think carefully before we make that decision. But I thank you for that question.